Welcome to Mayor Gray's third annual senior symposium. As I had a chance to speak to the mayor a moment ago, I told him it is because of him of why we have this senior symposium. We do a wonderful job for decades as the Office on Aging and hosting the mayor's annual holiday party. We do the senior picnic and uh, some years ago we did, we did Elder Fest. But when I think about those types of events, it was really recreational in nature, socialization, but it was not really an event that empowered our seniors with information. The event that we have today and the previous two events is an opportunity to share information. We have national experts as well as individuals from the federal government here today. So it's not only hearing from individuals from D.C. government or local leaders. We wanted you all to hear from other folks and see what they're doing in other jurisdictions. I've had an opportunity to travel the district with the mayor as he does, I call it as he'll say, his marathon of budget town hall meetings. And as we go across the district, the mayor will tell you, folks are always saying that they're doing it better in other states. Whether North Dakota has the best snow? <laughs> really? Whether Virginia has the best parking meters that don't break? And we have trouble in the District of Columbia? But you all know what? We have a lot of great things in the District of Columbia. Please, we have a lot of great things. Please clap for that. And if you don't believe it, for years, for years, I came to the Office on Aging in 2008, left, and I'm so blessed to come back and work for the, for the Deputy Mayor and work for the Mayor. And if you look at our budget and why I'm, I say we're so blessed, and I say it to the Mayor and I say it to the Deputy Mayor, they make my job easy. And I mean that, not that I have to slack off. They make my job easy because when you look at our budget, when we came in in 2011, the budget was only $25 million. When you look at our budget now, it is $42 million strong. $42 million strong. And that is a testament to the leadership, to the commitment, and to the vision of this great mayor. And I'm so delighted, I'm so blessed. I'm not, I don't even use the word proud. I go above that saying, I'm so blessed to be able to work for Mayor Gray and, and under his leadership. Please give him a round of applause. And so by now, everyone should have a program so you'll be able to navigate uh, throughout the day and knowing which workshops you'll be a part of. And before we go on with the program, I'd like to first uh, recognize, uh, of course, I'll bring Mayor Gray up in a moment, but I'd like to first recognize uh, B.B. Othero, Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services, B.B. <laughs> I, I don't get a chance to recognize her publicly, but I, I do want to say she is an awesome leader my mentor who has really made it so much better for me in the District of Columbia. I have to say that. She's made this journey a very worthwhile journey, and I, I just want to thank you so much, BB. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. I also want to recognize Michael Kelly, Director Kelly, from the Department of Housing and Community Development. Thank you, sir, for being here. You were here last year. It means the world to us. Ariana Kionis, who is the Deputy Mayor's Chief of Staff, BB's Chief of Staff. Ariana, thank you for being here again as well. I also want to recognize our Chairwoman for the Commission on Aging, Romaine Thomas. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your leadership, for your vision. And to our entire Commissioners on Aging, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. You all can stand up here and say a whole lot about what we're doing in D.C. Office on Aging and what the mayor has done, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, at this time, bring the mayor up and have him to share his wisdom, have him to share what he's doing in the District of Columbia and what we'll continue to do in the years to come as we develop, as we create this age-friendly city here in Washington, D.C. Mayor Gray. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thompson, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to thank you all for coming out. I want to thank Dr. Thompson, first of all, for uh, his exceptional leadership 
uh, of our uh, office uh, on aging, uh, our, our office of seniors, how is that? We're not going to say aging, office of seniors. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we have had in the past good leaders in that area, uh, people who really are uh, revered and uh, highly respected across the District of Columbia. But I tell you one thing, I think we made a great choice when we selected Dr. John Thompson to be able to lead this office. I too want to uh, thank Deputy Mayor Otero. Uh, she and I have been friends for a very, very long time. Uh, I well remember that conversation when we talked about her leaving the uh, nonprofit sector and coming to work uh, for government. Uh, she had worked around government, with government, but never in government. And uh, this has been quite a journey, uh, and I want to thank her for the leadership that she has provided in the health and human services area. It really doesn't get much tougher uh, than health and human services because the problems are spontaneous in many instances, and they're very difficult, and they're not accommodating enough to kind of line up and walk their way down in sequence. They just kind of come at you all at one time, and she has done a masterful job of helping us be able to address uh, the challenges of health and human services in the District of Columbia. So how about another hand for uh, our Deputy Mayor? I, too, want to recognize Michael Kelly, and I'm going to come back to uh, the housing piece in just a second. Uh, a gentleman who uh, led our housing authority at one point, uh, went off to uh, New York, Philadelphia, and then finally worked his way back south, where he never should have been the whole time. Uh, and we've got him back here now. We're not letting you go this time, Michael. You've got to stay. You've got to stay. I <laughs> uh, also want to thank Romaine Thomas, uh, who has been such a stalwart uh, for seniors in the District of Columbia and on so many other fronts. And, uh, of course, our good friends right in front of me, our good friends at Verizon, uh, who have really been an incredible uh, support uh, system, if you will, uh, support partner for seniors in the District of Columbia. Uh, Karen Campbell, uh, Joe Askew, Mario, uh, the whole crew has been wonderful, and we thank what you have demonstrated what public-private partnerships mean in the District of Columbia, and we are absolutely delighted to be able to call uh, you all a partner. In fact, we're delighted to be able to call you, and we promise to use Verizon. <laughs> Thank you all so much. <laughs> Uh, as Dr. Thompson indicated, this is our third annual uh, symposium, and it is wonderful to see the number of people who already uh, are here, and we know it will further fill up uh, during the day. Uh, looks like we're about three quarters filled uh, already uh, in this ballroom, and uh, it will give us an opportunity again at this third annual senior symposium to talk about the issues that are most important uh, to uh, seniors uh, in the District of Columbia. Um, we, um, we work hard uh, to try to be an inclusive and accessible uh, urban environment. And uh, if you don't include seniors, if you're not mindful of the issues that challenge uh, seniors in the District of Columbia, you will never be uh, an inclusive city. You'll never be the kind of city that it is uh, we want to be. I want to commend uh, Dr. Thompson and his staff on the theme for this year, and that is safe today and healthy tomorrow. And I hope that we will have some robust discussion today about how we can achieve uh, those goals. We have tried to make sure uh, that we, uh, as they say, put our money where our mouth is. Uh, and that, that has demonstrated itself uh, in what was alluded to earlier, and that is having increased over the last three plus years the budget in the Office of Aging by 50%. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I don't care what time of uh, you know, one's life it is, that is, a, that is a huge increase and a huge commitment in services for people who have paved the way for so many others uh, with their uh, lives. Uh, we have a, quite a network at this stage. Uh, we're able to fund uh, 20 community-based uh, nonprofits uh, who are operating some 37 programs uh, and a wide range of social and health uh, services that are being provided to our seniors across the uh, District of Columbia. We have, uh, by the way, we uh, have in the 15 budget, which we've been discussing in our road show uh, across the District of Columbia, we, have, we had our seventh uh, town hall meeting last night. 
Uh, we'll be coming to Ward 5 uh, tomorrow night. Ward 5, we're looking forward to being with you all. <laughs> And Connie, as you know, we've already been to Ward 7, uh, and we will go anywhere uh, that, you know, where people want to talk about how we improve uh, services. And the geography of the District of Columbia is not that challenging that we can't make the trip across the, uh, across the city. You know, it is interesting when you go to these meetings and people will stand up and say, you know, you ought to go to, um, you ought to, go to South Dakota and see how they do it there. You ought to go to Wyoming. Uh, how about North Dakota? How about Idaho? You know, and, and there, there was somebody uh, a week and a half or two weeks ago who said, you know, the meters work perfectly in Virginia, and the meters always seem to be broken in, in Virginia. And I said, you know, isn't it time for us to become an advocate for ourselves? Our city is doing pretty doggone good, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm not going to make any apologies to anybody. Does everything work perfectly every day? Absolutely not. But anybody that tells you that it works perfectly in one of these other places all day, every day, I'll show you a liar, right? Because they, they are not informed. So let's be an advocate for our city. As we're an advocate for our seniors and our children, let's be an advocate for our city so the people know we are growing every day. 11, 1,200 new people every day. We are investing in ways that other folks haven't done. We are opening doors that haven't been opened before. So come on, ladies and gentlemen, let's stand up for the District of Columbia until we become the 51st state, New, new Columbia. And you can be doggone sure, if we don't do it, nobody else is going to do it. And you know what? You probably get some converts. Because if you bring the energy, the vibrancy, the enthusiasm, they'll just join in with you because it feels like a good thing to do, y'all. So if you bring it, they'll join in with you. And that's our job, to be able to get more and more people talking about the District of Columbia. I had a mayor in my office the other day. And this is the truth. It's honestly, honestly the truth. He said, he's a mayor of a big city, a very successful mayor. And he said, how have you all done this? I said, done what? He said, this city is absolutely on fire. He said, this city is amazing. How have you all done this? And you know what? I proceeded to tell him. I only took about two more hours of his time to brag about the District of Columbia. But that's the kind of image that's being portrayed of this city now across the nation. And if we don't believe it ourselves, if we don't embrace it ourselves, we certainly can't expect other people to do it. Because that's how it happens. I'm waiting for somebody to go to a town hall meeting in, uh, in, 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 in somewhere in, you know, in Virginia or North Carolina and say, man, y'all ought to go to the District of Columbia and see how they do it. They got it going on there, y'all. And even if it's not all true, we don't care. It sounds good. <laughs> and you know, we have in the 15 budget an increase of $2 million for our wellness centers. And you know what that's going to allow us to do? First of all, it's going to allow us to be able to add more hours each day. Now, right now, our wellness centers are typically open Monday through Friday. And we heard you all at past symposia. We heard you that we wanted more hours available each day because we have seniors who work who want to be able to go there when the day is done, right? So we're going to add more hours to our wellness centers. And guess what we're going to do also? Where did Dr. Thompson go? There he is. We're going to do one more thing, right, Dr. Thompson? We're going to start opening our wellness centers on weekends so that people can participate on weekends if they want to. You know, this will allow folks to take advantage of services that they like Monday through Friday, and frankly, take advantage of seeing somebody you want to see on the weekends. <laughs> Nobody wants to sit home all weekend unless you just want to watch, watch, uh, watch sports. I mean, and we, and we have lots of sports activities now. Hey, how about those wizards, you all? <laughs> Man, this is a at the Verizon Center, they're coming Friday, at the Verizon Center. <laughs> the Wizards haven't been to the second round of playoffs since uh, 
now in the last century, but I think it's like the late 1970s or 80s or something like that. Boy, we got it going. I'm telling you, man, the District of Columbia's got it going on. You know, y'all have even inspired our basketball team to go up to Indiana and knock them out of the box the other night. And I think, aren't we playing tonight? We're going to get them again tonight, y'all. And even if we don't, we'll be coming home with a one-in-one record, and we will have home court advantage at that stage because we beat them the other night. And so we have uh, we've, uh, also worked on our food budget. And uh, that's one of the most important things because, you know, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, there are three things that challenge people, and that is shelter, food, clothing. And those are the three things that we want to make absolutely sure that we do uh, for our seniors. We, um, across the nation now, have gone from 2.3 million uh, seniors who have, we got a new term, we got food insecurity. When I was growing up, we had a fancy term called, like, I'm hungry, okay? <laughs> so, but now we have food insecurity. And we've gone from 2.3 million seniors uh, without adequate food. Uh, that was back just at the turn of the century in 2001 to now having 4.8 million seniors who are uh, experiencing food uh, insecurity. And to address that, we, uh, we now have a food budget that we have increased by 3.7 million uh, over 3.7 million uh, dollars over the last two years, which means we have more than doubled the food budget in the District of Columbia. And we have, we have served, we have served over the last uh, 12 months over 800,000 meals to seniors in the District of Columbia. We have uh, had over 300,000, almost 350,000 of those meals uh, have gone to people who are living in uh, apartments, and we have had another almost 500,000 uh, of those meals that were delivered to uh, homebound uh, seniors. So making sure the meals are available in the wellness centers, and then for those who, we, who need this kind of service, we've been also taking, the, um, taking meals uh, to them. We also have done something else, and I want to thank again Dr. Thompson and Deputy Mayor Otero, and that is we've transferred the uh, Commodity Food Supplemental Program from the Department of Health, Health over to uh, the Office on Aging so that we would be able to unite uh, all of our programs uh, in one place to make them easier to administer and more uh, accessible. So uh, we, uh, we also have done one other thing. And that is, our transportation budget has increased also, hasn't it? We had a budget, we had a budget for, of, I don't know, $2.4 million. And we heard you loudly and clearly. We heard you at this symposium last year, and we have heard you during the year. And that is, we want to be able to have more reliable transportation. We want to be able to go to the places that we want to go to. And so, we have worked it out. <clears throat> we have worked it out so that now, one, our transportation budget has gone from $2.4 million up to $6 million, ladies and gentlemen. We have a partner that we've been working with, and that is Seabury uh, Resources. Uh, they now have worked to be able to increase the reliability of transportation uh, in the District of Columbia for our seniors. There used to be times when uh, the wait for a pickup uh, was as much as two hours, and that's a long time. And so they've now reduced it. We still got more work to do, but they've reduced it from two hours down to 45 minutes. We also, we also are working with our taxi cabs. Uh, how do y'all like the new colors of our taxi cabs? You know what? You can, you, you, you know, a cab is coming now when you see that red and gray, right? <laughs> And it, may, it makes the taxi cabs compatible with the other public conveyances in the city. If you look at Metro, if you look at Circulator, uh, if you look at the streetcars that will be coming later this year, they're all pretty much the same color. And they have new dome lights where, uh, you know, I don't care what your eyesight is, you'll be able to see those dome lights. <laughs> 
and we got meters that work now. Uh, it, really, it really is helping, ladies and gentlemen, to change the, the hospitality industry in the District of Columbia. But we also now will have our taxi cabs who will be working on behalf of seniors who need to go to medical appointments. It used to be that Metro Access would cost, uh, cost who were paid, whoever paid, it was like $50 per trip. And we've managed now to get our taxi cab industry involved in this, and we've reduced by a third, reduced by a third, the cost of being able to move people around uh, in a much more reliable, uh, a quicker way. Let's put it that way. I won't say reliable. A couple of th other things I'll mention. First of all, I'm, uh, I'm really excited about the fact that we're working on age-friendly uh, D.C. with the World Health Organization. We committed ourselves about a year ago uh, to doing that, and there's a lot of work uh, been done. I saw Gail here somewhere. Where is she? Where's Gail? There she is back there. She is leading the effort on age-friendly D.C. Gail Cohen. Gail, thank you very much. We are doing a variety of block-by-block -block analyses. Uh, I've been out on one of them myself, and a lot of things are being discovered. You know, that sidewalks are uneven in certain places. Uh, there are cracks in certain areas. Uh, maybe the lighting isn't as good as it should be in some areas. Those are the things, those are the not-so-little things that will make us a better city and will help us become an age-friendly city. We, I think, will have our strategic plan completed later this year. And by, eight, by 2017, our goal is to be able to be certified as an age-friendly city in the, in the uh, nation, in, in, in the United States of America. And then one other thing that I will mention is, and uh, I know this involves, uh, this involves uh, Michael Kelly uh, as well, and that is I was glad to join with um, I was glad to join with Councilmember uh, Barnes, uh, who had some legislation that I was pleased to sign, as a part of an overall effort to make sure that we continue to be, as this city is in big demand, that we continue to be an affordable city. You know, we've had 40,000 people in the last 10 years to leave the District of Columbia. We don't know all the reasons why they've left, but we know some of them have left because they couldn't afford to live uh, in the city anymore. We can't be the city that we want to be if we have people who say, I really want to continue to live here, but I can't afford to live here anymore. And that's why we have put, in the past year, $187 million into affordable housing in the District of Columbia. We have, right, Michael, 47 projects that are under construction or under renovation that are being readied. And what does it mean to us when we put that money in? <clears throat> it means that we will invest in your housing project, whatever it may be, if in return for that <clears throat> you will use that money to lower the cost of that housing, to lower the purchase price or to lower the rental price so that those who may be economically on fixed incomes and whatnot, especially our seniors, will be able to live in a place that they have helped to bring uh, to where it is uh, today. We have this new bill that, that Councilmember Barnes uh, sponsored that I was happy to sign and fund in this budget. And it, uh, what it does is the following. If, if somebody is uh, at least 70 years of age, if your adjusted gross income is no more than $60,000 a year, and if you have owned a home, and we're tinkering with this a little bit to make it a little more flexible, if you've owned a home for 20 years uh, in the District of Columbia, those three things, $60,000, age 70, and you own a home in the District of Columbia, it means that you will never again have to pay property taxes in the District of Columbia. Now, that's, that's a good thing, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And what we want to hear from, what we want to hear from you all today is how we continue to make this city a place that you can be proud of, a city that you can call home, that when people want to come uh, and visit you, they don't have to go to Leisure World or somewhere else outside the city in order to be able to do that. They can do that right here in the great city District of Columbia one day to be the state uh, of New Columbia. 
So it's an exciting time, <clears throat> time in the city. It's an exciting time in this room. This room is now almost filled just, just since I've been standing here because of the number of people who are committed uh, to seniors in the District of Columbia. I don't know how many seniors we have now, uh, Dr. Thompson. 104,000. That's a lot of people. That is a huge block of people uh, in the District of Columbia. So, ladies and gentlemen, at this third annual symposium, I invite you to have a great day. I invite you to talk about the ideas that are important to you. And the only bad idea is the idea that you don't feel comfortable putting on the table. Put it on the table and then let somebody explain to you why it's not a good idea. And most often, it's going to be a great idea. So thank you all very much. Have a great day and happy third annual symposium. First of all, let me say good morning to all of you. And as I look over this room and look out here at this sea of faces, I am so proud and to say that I think I know half, if not half, maybe more of the people in this room. And you know why? Because I've been living a long time. <laughs> so I want to say to you that I am so pleased to be part of this gathering. But I want to, after living a long time, sometimes some things, a lot of things, you learn a lot of things just through experiences and just through living. And one is that it's a very simple fact that never will all of these people be in the same place at the same time again or during this whole lifetime. Am I right? Yes, I am. So we're going to do something because we're going to take the magic and this moment. We're going to say, because we are all here, and give a salute to our mayor while everybody's standing who's able to stand to thank him and to say we appreciate his leadership and all the things that he has done for this city. And those of you, I'm so happy that you have. We're so proud. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we love you. <laughs> uh, let me say, too, that I am so happy that we have Dr. Thompson as our leader because he's a young, energetic, uh, energetic, I said energetic, energetic <laughs> young man who uh, brings so much to this agency and to the whole concept of what we're dealing with in terms of aging. And, I'm, and we are very pleased and happy to have him. So also very briefly, I want to recognize our commissioners. And I know that Dr. Thompson did do that, but sometimes people living in different wards, you don't know the, who the commissioners are. And the commissioners are those folks who work to represent you and to also serve as advocates for this uh, for our senior citizens. And along with that, we have what we call many commissioners who support and bring another aspect, another reference in terms of working with people at the community level. So first of all, I want to identify those commissioners who are here. Some of the commissioners have not arrived, but Mr. Ron Swanda, Commissioner Ron Swanda, who is our vice chair, uh, that we recognize Commissioner Ron Swanda, Commissioner Brenda Williams, and, and he represents Ward 6, right? Commissioner Brenda Williams represents Ward 1. So everybody recognize Ward 1 people. Grace Lewis, who recognizes and works with me in Ward 5. I am a commissioner from Ward 5. We recognize her. And, and Commissioner Constance Woody. She's from Ward 7, and we recognize her. And let's see who else is there. Commissioner Carolyn Nichols is here. We recognize her. Uh, she is from Ward 4. And then we have Commissioner Brenda Atkinson Willoughby, who is from Ward 4 also. She recognizes Ward 4. And we also have our commissioner from, another commissioner from Ward 4, that's Sam. Okay, Sam. <laughs> so I do that 
that because I think we need to take advantage of every opportunity in terms of making sure that people have the right communication, the right understanding, and the right representation. And I am pleased to join into this conference because it focuses on an aspect of our society in which we don't give much attention, and we want to make sure that uh, we do that. And as we age, and we all want to try to live to that ripe old age, we want to make sure that living conditions are in such a way that we can all be comfortable, we can be safe, and we can have understanding. How many of you saw the airing on 60 Minutes recently by, with, Linda, uh, with Leslie Stahl? And it was, I think it took place on May the 4th recently. And he talked about the uh, study that's going on for 90 plus. Many people in here see that? Did many of you see that segment? Well, I hope they'll show it again so all but everybody can take advantage of it. But this regards the study of people who are 90 and over. Anybody 90 in here today? Well, you're going to live to 90. <laughs> I'll say that. I'll predict that. But anyway, it is an excellent movement in terms of longevity and trying to understand why people live to 90. They don't have much, many facts in terms of people, why people are living to 90, but the research is continuing. So this is a special study that's going on concerning people 90 plus. And I said that and focus on that because I think that's what we need to focus on when we're looking at such concepts as the age-friendly city. It means that we're going to do that because we all want to live longer, and we all want to live past 90, if that's possible. So that is why we're here today, and we want to support all of those efforts and support the kind of respect, the kind of understanding, the kind of kindness, and the goodness that we can all bring to each other, that we can bring to the city, and that we can all live with goodness in terms of being the kind of citizens that we can be proud of. So to God be the glory. Thank you, Commissioner Thomas. Uh, our last person who's going to be speaking this morning is uh, from Verizon. I tell you, it is great to have wonderful partners. I tell you, we have a lot of, of course, govern governmental agencies that provide the support but to have corporate sponsorship, not only just that sponsorship when we think about money, but to have partners who are with us in the community. And Verizon, and I, and I say to Mario often, I mean, they're actually in the community in place and I show up and Verizon is there at our wellness centers. And that means a lot, an opportunity to educate our seniors on the latest technology. I often tell folks that my dad for the longest, he's 71 years of age, and for the longest, my now 72, for the longest, my dad, the only thing he knew what to do with the computer is to pick it up from one room to take it to the other room. <laughs> now my dad can turn on, the, uh, on, on his uh, computer. Now he knows how to use a tablet and makes good use of, uh, use of it. Forever, he would call me and say, John, I need you to get me a plane ticket. Now he calls me. He, he's gotten his own plane ticket online. And so uh, our seniors can utilize technology, especially think about those seniors who are socially isolated and they have loved ones in other parts of the country. Now there's a chance to use technology so that they can keep in contact with their loved ones. And so Verizon has been that excellent partner in training our seniors across the District of Columbia at our Senior Wellness Center. In fact, they're in the midst of going to Ward 5, two different locations. I even shared it with Mario on Monday that we'll go to probably a senior building in my neck of the woods, Fort Lincoln, also to our Ward 5 Senior Wellness Center. And so, uh, Verizon, I thank you all for everything you're doing at this time. I'm going to ask Karen Campbell if she would come up here and say a few words. Karen is Vice President of State Government Affairs of Verizon, the Mid-Atlantic Region. And so again, I want to publicly thank them for their wonderful service and being a wonderful partner to the Office on Aging and to District Government. Thank you so much. Karen. Good morning. So how's everybody doing this morning? Excited? I think I'm the last thing holding you from the fabulous workshops that are scheduled here today. So first of all, let me thank uh, Mayor Gray, certainly for his vision and for his commitment to making uh, DC an age-friendly city. Thank you, of course, to Dr. Thompson, 
Uh, we have had a phenomenal partnership with the district's office on aging, and it's very exciting for us. And we're excited to be here for the second year and certainly to celebrate your third year of this fabulous uh, senior symposium. So you, you might wonder, so why is it that we are so connected to our senior community? And, and what does age-friendly actually mean? And what does it mean to Verizon? So I, I want to make sure that I get this right, because the mayor and his team have spent countless hours trying to identify what it is about this age-friendly initiative that's so important to the district. So what does it mean? Age-friendly DC is focused on making sure that residents aged 50 and above, and I am almost there, <laughs> and I'm happy to admit that, aged 50 and above, um, and have a coordinated effort whose goal is to make sure that they are connected and committed and engaged and happy in their environment. So what's important to us? Key word for Verizon is connected. We have a fabulous network of employees, equipment, but really the connection is not about the equipment that makes it happen. It's about what you can do with that connection. So whether it's downloading an app that helps you be healthier, downloading an app that helps you find the cheapest gas on Georgia Avenue, I use Gas Buddy all the time, whether it's using FaceTime or Skype to talk to a grandson or granddaughter that might be serving our country, whether it's introducing yourself to a new grandbaby or great-grandbaby that you haven't seen that happens to live in Oakland, California. It's really about what the technology enables, to, for, enables you to do. And in fact, Verizon has invested over $100 million on our fiber network in the district. We're happy to do that, and we're excited to do that. We've also invested heavily in our 4G LTE technology. Show of hands, how many of you have your, your cell phone or your iPhone or your iPad with you? I, I should be seeing lots and lots of hands, right? <laughs> I hope that they're Verizon equipment, really. Um, but I will tell you that our Verizon folks from our wireless team are outside here, ready, willing, and able to help you with any questions that you might have about the technology, how to use it, how to use the cell phones, how to, questions about your service. I would encourage you to go outside and talk to the Verizon team. We're happy to be here and happy to help. So again, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks again for Dr. Thompson. Thanks again to Bibi and her team for all the work and the Department on Aging that you're doing to make sure our seniors stay connected. I'm really enthusiastic and excited to see that you're tweeting, you're posting on Facebook, you're using social media as I know that you do, and you're excited to do that. And so we're happy to be here and happy to help and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Karen, thank you so much for those words. And so, you all, with your Verizon tools, with your electronics, so make sure you do tweet today and email others or send a text to others about this wonderful symposium uh, that's before you today. At this time, we're a little bit behind schedule, but that's not a big deal because uh, we built in some uh, additional time right before lunch. But if you would, if you can get your program out and look at uh, which workshop you plan on attending, uh, your first work workshop that begins at 10 o'clock, please uh, go to that location. If you're having trouble in finding that location, please let uh, any one of our staff members know. And before we, before we break you, I want to first recognize the D.C. Office on Aging uh, team. We could not have hosted this event if it wasn't for the team. And so if my team would raise their hand, those folks who are in here, D.C. Office on Aging, if you would raise your hand, we have about, about 50 of us here today. And so I want to thank them for their hard work and their dedication in serving district seniors. So at this time, if you'll uh, uh, go to that first session, and we'll come back in this room uh, for our uh, lunchtime uh, event. Thank you so much, you all. I'm Gail Cohn. I'm the age-friendly DC coordinator. And we have some special treats for you today. But I, I first wanted to comment to you that you probably have already observed that the World Health Organization age-friendly city concept has been woven through the entire symposium today. 
So wherever you go, you're going to have another view of what we're doing in the city that has to do with age friendliness. What are we doing to get ready for the future? That's what the World Health Organization Age Friendly DC initiative is about. We are getting ready for the future. And that's the first topic we're gonna cover later in this program. The second thing we're going to cover is creative ways you'll want to consider staying in your own neighborhood. One of the things that's going to happen as we grow older is we may have less resources, less financial resources, and we may want to have additional people who are involved in our lives, and that's what we're going to hear about next. And we'll hear that from Beth <coughs> Baker, who has written a book about this that you will, will learn more about. And then finally, uh, Earlier in the presentation, Romaine Thomas, do you remember who Romaine Thomas is? She's the Commission on Aging Chair. Romaine Thomas said it would be fun to get to be 90. That's what she said. And I agree with her. I, w I would love to live to be 90. How many of you would love to live to be 90? Yeah, yeah. But you want to live to be 90 with a feeling that you want to get up in the morning. Yeah, you, ju you don't want to just get there, do you? You want to enjoy life enough that you want to get up in the morning and have things that you have to get done. You want a purpose. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, next. So the first thing we're going to cover is Beth Baker and how to stay put in your neighborhood. going to be talking about that innermost circle of our age-friendly communities, and that is our homes. And I've gone around the country for many years interviewing, I don't know how many people, older people, about how they imagine their future and what they're doing to take charge of it as best they can. And I've learned a couple key lessons I wanted to share to start off. One is that denial is not our friend. And by that, I mean if we are in denial that we're growing older, it leaves us more vulnerable to ending up living alone and isolated or ending up moving to institutions that might not be our first choice. Second, I've learned that we as individuals need to find the right balance between independence and autonomy on the one hand and relationships and community on the other hand. I think sometimes in our culture, the independence piece has outweighed the relationships and community piece to our detriment. So how does this relate to housing and age-friendly communities? Well, of course, we need to plan for any physical changes if our mobility declines and our vision Will our homes serve us, or will they be an impediment to our well-being? But perhaps as important or more important than adapting our homes is we need to ask ourselves, how will the fabric of our lives be woven? Are there people nearby, family, neighbors, friends, members of our congregation who care about us, who will be willing to help us or accept help from us. And that's what I explore in my book, which is called With a Little Help from Our Friends. I learned that around the country, people are trying to be proactive and create <coughs> networks that will support them in their communities. Whether that re means remaining in your own home or moving to a different place that serves you better. And there's all kinds of great alternatives out there that people are creating. And I'm just going to tell you about a few of them. One is the village model, which probably a lot of you have heard of. It's a Neighbors Helping Neighbors membership organization. And there's a whole session devoted to villages today, so I'm not going to dwell too much on it, but I wanted to be sure to mention it. And Washington, D.C., the metropolitan area, 
I think has more villages than any place in the United States. And Gail Cohn um, led Capitol Hill Village, one of the most successful in the country. So in a village, you pay to become a member, and that allows you access to volunteer help, as well as a whole social network and classes, wellness, all sorts of things. Another model is called a NORC for Naturally Occurring Retirement Community. And this, these are created in places where there's a significant number of older people in a neighborhood or in a town. And when they realize that there's a significant number of people who want to stay in their communities, they support a system of supportive services. They create this system to help people achieve that goal. And a really good one is right nearby in Greenbelt, Maryland. A lot of Greenbelt residents moved there right after World War II as young adults, and they're now getting pretty old. And the city decided to hire a community resources advocate named Crystal Beatty to conduct a needs assessment and figure out what they needed to keep older people in their community. And they met for two years, a task force of older people. They conducted surveys and focus groups. And they found that the overwhelming response of citizens is that they did not want an assisted living place built in Greenbelt. They did not want a nursing home built in Greenbelt. They wanted to stay in their own homes. And as Crystal told me, they said, you're going to have to take me out of Greenbelt in a box. They did not want to leave their homes. So in response, instead of building bricks and mortar, Greenbelt built a wide-ranging services program called Greenbelt Assistance in Living, or GALE, for people who are older or who have disabilities. And the program has grown from 85 clients in 2003 to 900 today. And they started off just providing information to people, but now they have mobile counseling and case management coming to people's homes, home visits for everything from bathing to blood sugar monitoring, patient advocacy during physician appointments. And Crystal Beatty did something I thought was really smart, is she formed partnerships with nursing schools and med schools and created a geriatric rotation for these students. So the people doing these home visits are young um, nursing and medical students. And the idea, hopefully, is that they'll also get a taste for geriatrics and get interested in pursuing that. And it's all free as a result. Greenbelt also got some HUD money to offer subsidies to help people uh, make their homes accessible, which is really important there because the homes, none of the original homes have bathrooms on the first floor, for example. And like the villages in Greenbelt, older people stay connected through social events. They have a volunteer bank of more than 200 volunteers, and 70% of the volunteers, and you won't be surprised, are older people themselves who want to help their neighbors. In many ways, Norks and villages are similar. The difference is, with a village, it's you pay to become a member. So two people could be in the same neighborhood, one's a member, one isn't. In Greenbelt, the city pays for this. So every older member, older resident of Greenbelt is eligible to participate in Gale, which I think is nice. Um, another familiar option for um, living as we grow older is house sharing. Now, we all know that families have been doing this forever, multiple generations sharing a home. And that's on the rise again after falling for many years, partly because of the recession. But also, I think people are finding real advantages to living together in multiple generations. And it's not just the young folks taking care of grandma, which is sort of how it was when I was a child. But of course, more and more, it's grandma taking care of the younger generations. 
whether the, the kids or being supportive of their adult children who may need a hand. But the point is that this is not a one-way street when families live together. When it works best is when it's a reciprocal relationship, each generation helping the other. There's lots of other forms of house sharing I learned about. Uh, one is, um, there's a one in Baltimore called St. Ambrose. It's a nonprofit. And it's basically a matchmaking service for older people who are alone in their own homes and having trouble affording it, or they may feel insecure. And they match them with younger people who cannot afford to have their own full house. And what's, of course, anybody could do that on Craigslist, but what St. Ambrose does is background checks on the home seekers. They try to match people by temperament and interests, and they're there in the long haul if you need somebody to mediate a problem. This is a really affordable way for people to house share. There's also a, um, a resurgence of the Golden Girls. I don't know if you remember the old TV show, but increasingly friends, usually women, are um, deciding to live together. And I learned that just this week, a new national um, web service, basically, I think it's called the Golden Girls Network, is being launched. So if your best friend isn't available to move in with you, again, they'll try to match you with new friends that you might share a home with. And yet another form of house sharing is when a city or a nonprofit buys a house and turns it basically into a group home for independent adults. So each person has a bedroom of their own, a bathroom of their own, and then they share kitchen and living room together. And what I like about these homes are just in normal neighborhoods. They look normal. So people are really part of the community and not somehow marginalized. I think house sharing is going to continue to grow as our population ages and it's affordable. And I think people really like it. Another model that was the most inspiring that I found in the whole United States was founded by a nonprofit called Generations of Hope. The model was started in Illinois on an abandoned Air Force base by a woman named Brenda Ehart, who had worked with foster care children her whole professional life and was so sick of feeling like we were failing foster children. And she tried to reimagine what would make their lives better. And she realized it was something pretty simple, and that was creating a normalcy, normalcy for these kids. So she set about to create an intentional community from scratch. And who was invited to live in this community were foster children, families who wanted to adopt foster children, and their own kids, whether they were adopted or natural children. And the interesting piece is she included elders in the community. So the elders live there for reduced rent, and they sign a contract saying they will volunteer in the community, I think it's six hours a week. So what's happening is these elders are becoming surrogate grandparents to the kids. And it's, it's really a beautiful story. And now there's one in Oregon and now in Massachusetts. And just recently there's been some um, effort to think about creating two small communities like this here in Washington, which I was really excited to hear. These foster kids, by the way, at Hope Meadows, which is the name of the first one, 100% of them uh, who have been adopted have graduated from high school and nationally 30% of foster kids graduate from high school. So it's, it's really a success story and all parties there, including the older people who I interviewed, feel such a sense of purpose and belonging. So I really hope that takes off here. And Brenda Ehart's idea is that this model doesn't have to be limited to foster kids. She's talking about people coming out of prison benefiting from a community like this, wounded veterans coming back from war, 
young teen mothers, and people with Alzheimer's disease. The idea is to create these communities where everybody's looking out for each other. I'm going to shorten it since our time got short. The idea that I want to convey to you and that I hope you'll leave here with is that by being creative, people are coming up with all sorts of doable, affordable options. I think we have to get rid of a cookie cutter mentality or an image of large housing complexes where we put those people, whether it's low income people, whether it's older people. I think most people just want to live in either their own homes or small settings supported by people who care about them. So I hope we can broaden our perspective of what makes good housing, what makes good community, and what makes a good quality of life, and root that in human values of social connection. Thanks very much for your time. This is the book Beth wrote. This is the book that she wrote that she was talking about the models that we just heard about. How many of you have visited Greenbelt, Maryland? A couple of you are aware. It's, a, it's right there on the Beltway in Prince George's County, and it's a, it's a, it's a lovely village-like uh, place. Um, but I will tell you that that kind of service activity could happen here in D.C. in every, every neighborhood. We could do this. We could do this. The, the, um, um, I'm not, I, I will ask you to hold questions to the end, but I, I really want you to keep, keep that thought in your mind. I don't want you to lose it. Villages, yes, Beth is right. There are already, in this, in this D.C. area, right here in our city, 12 villages, groups where people can work together to stay put. And in the metropolitan area in Maryland and in uh, Virginia, there are a total of 40 right here in our area. If you want to hear more about villages, stick around in this room. Uh, the next uh, presentation is going to be by uh, Candace Baldwin, and she's going to talk about villages. And, and that's a good model for helping people to stay put in their own homes. The, the whole Generations of Hope idea, does that not turn you on? I love kids, and the idea of living with children who have not had the right start and getting that group together with older persons who, who have had have the warmth and ability to hug and, and talk to children. I think it's a wonderful concept, and there are two of them on the drawing board in D.C. So Generations of Hope, keep your uh, mind aware, uh, is going to be something that we will see in D.C. Now, we're going to move on, and the center of the discussion here by Gay Hanna is going to be, she is the executive director of the National Center for Creative Aging. And this book that was written by Dr. Jean Cohen sums up the issues associated with us as we grow older wanting to get up in the morning because there's something really exciting and important for us to do. Gay? Good morning, everybody. Oh, we finally got rid of the snow. We've got some sunshine. Washington is just beautiful in all weather, but especially the springtime. I'm here to, to share with you the gift of creativity. Uh, Carl Jung, who talked about how we live our lives, said that creativity and spirituality never dim as we age. In fact, they get brighter and more powerful. So Gay, thank you for inviting us here to be part of this very exciting session on Age-Friendly DC. Thank, thank Dr. Thompson for his leadership and Beth for her very wonderful work on the intimacy of how we can find 
vibrant ways to live together and age together through thinking creativity, creatively. <laughs> uh, Alessia, thank you for the dance, and she will come back to get our minds going with a poem at the end. And Rick, thank you for coming over from the VA. Rick is a veteran, actually still active in the National Guard, and he plays for the veterans every week at the Community Living Center. Now you may think, why is creativity so important? Did you feel what music did for this room? How about when you started to move? Didn't your thinking get sharper? So creativity, as the mayor charged us to do, really empowers you all your life. It's what gets you started in learning things. It, it is what makes you find a career and be good in it. Creativity is how you parent your children, and it's the legacy that you leave. Creativity is, in essence, how you build your personal story, and it's also how you build your community. So I would put it right up there with Maslow's laws, right with feeding, shelter, safety, and it's all based on how create, creative you can be living your life with fun and energy and enjoying and loving the people around you. Let's see, is this the key? Okay. So the creative age. Again, we support age-friendly DC. You might wonder, well, creativity, I understand. How does that relate to age-friendly DC? Well, cities, in essence, are very creative places. And we know from Washington, D.C., that brought us Duke Ellington, that brings us the Cherry Blossom Festivals, that brings us all the beautiful monuments that create. This is a center of creativity for the whole world. Now, how do we access that as people, you and me, and as part of our community? Again, Gail mentioned Dr. Gene Cohen. Let me tell you a little bit about Gene. He actually lived right in the center of um, Adams Morgan. He was the director of the National Institute on Aging, and he was a very serious geriopsychiatrist. So he knew and studied the brain, studied at Harvard, and he studied it as, oh, what can make the brain better, what makes it worse, in a very clinical fashion. And as his career progressed, he found out that it's really what you do with your brain that makes it good and makes it grow or makes it shrink. So he would say that we often think of aging as a disease. How many of you think, think that way? No, aging isn't a disease. What is aging about when you think of aging? It's a process, it's a natural process. It's a time when you have more time, in fact, to reflect upon your life. Because what have you gained? You've gained a lot of life experience. So Jean actually said that creativity, what has been denied in aging, is the potential. And I feel like everybody in this room understands the great potential there is in aging. And he said the creative expression was the greatest form of this potential. So again, when we have, at this point, 10,000 baby boomers turning 65 every day, 10,000 of us, and we have, do you know what the fastest percentage of this population that's growing in this country? 
Do you know what age that is? 85 plus is the fastest growing population because we have gained 30 extra years since the 1900s. In the 1900, you were expected to age to 45. Think of that, 45. By the end of the 20th century, we had an age expectancy of near 80, and over 80 for women. Do you guys know the age expectancy of most children born at the turn of the 21st century? A hundred, a high percentage, they'll reach a hundred. So it's different, aging is different, and we have a lot that we can contribute and give. Now you might wonder, why in the world did we put chocolate kisses on your tables? We do love you, that's for sure. But we wanted to emphasize that when you use your brain doing something creative, that doesn't mean that you need to be Picasso or, or Rembrandt or or Michelangelo, it means that you think of how you're going to live in your home differently. You think about how you're going to share your talents, whether it's gardening, whether it's cooking, even how you dress. And I know we've got wonderful dressers in this crowd. It's all about enjoying the gifts that you have been given. And the second part of that is sharing the gifts that you've been given. So I want to emphasize, contrary to popular belief, Dr. Cohen found, and he wrote a book, another book called The Mature Mind, that not only does, do we get better as people as we age through our life experience, but our brains can get better. They don't have to get worse. He said uh, that, of course, we'll have senior moments from time to time, but that our brain, when it's doing something that's creative, and that usually means, for most of us, solving a problem. When we are thinking about solutions and how to improve the lives of ourselves and others, it's like our brain, you know, we have two halves hemispheres in our brain. And as we grow, the hemispheres develop. One side, the right side, really is very much uh, creative and uses the arts. The left side is very much analytical and uses math and calculation. And people like me have been far more right-sided, never did well in math. Uh, but when we age, our brains both have start to work together. And getting back to the chocolate, Dr. Cohen said that when you use your brain engaging in something, a puzzle, a good healthy exercise in an interesting place, that you're surrounded with people and you stay socially engaged, that it's like chocolate for your brain. Now finally, I'll tell you about a gathering. I am with the National Center for Creative Aging, and our mission is to create opportunities where all of you can be engaged. Usually we focus on arts activities, but storytelling, we even have a program called Beautiful Minds. And this is where we collect people's stories and hear about the fascinating ways that people have solved uh, problems and changed the way they live, reimagined their lives, continued their vibrant living. We are affiliated with George Washington University. And for those of you that are practitioners in aging services, I know we have a few of you here. We're affiliated with the Washington DC, we put this on your table, 
Geriatric Education Center. And this center trains aging professionals, nurses, and doctors to look as they care for older people first that they know the person that they're talking to. And second, that they have the highest quality care. We also will be having a conference called the Creative Age at Arena Stage, June 10th through 14th. And last, we certainly uh, ask you to contact us. There are resources in your communities. Our home is at Iona Senior Services, and I'd like to ask Sally White to stand up. She's the executive director. And of course, they have an arts and wellness center, and the arts are vibrant, as well as many other activities that can be used to enhance your lives creatively. So again, thank you for having us here today. We're your resource. We hope you're, we encourage each other as we go through this part of our lives. And you'll hear from Alessia and Rick at the end of the program. So again, thank you, Gail. And enjoy your chocolate. But remember, work your brain so you have chocolate on your brain. Now, how many of you uh, have eaten the chocolate already? <laughs> All right, very good. Well, your brains are active and I appreciate that. I need that for this latter part of the presentation. What I'm going to do is talk with you about uh, where we're going in DC. And we are in a, in a situation here with World Health Organization in which we have been reflecting on what it is that is wonderful about DC and you've told us. Many of you were involved. How many of you were here last year at the symposium last year? A lot of you. Um, and you remember using those electronic clickers to answer questions? And how many of you have participated in community consultations? You came together and talked about all the age-friendly domains. Can I see some hands on that? Yes, there were many of you who got involved. We talked to people across the city. There were more than 1,000 who participated in those community consultations. And how many of you were at the mayor's update last fall, in which we, you've got a hand in the air there uh, on that one and a couple more. Uh, there you used those clickers again and gave us information. How many of you are AARP members? Oh my goodness, look at that. And, and those of you who are in the room who are AARP members, how many of you participated in the survey about age friendly? Yeah, you knew about this. See, there are a whole bunch of you. This is where all the information that we have collected about the city has come from. And that's what we're using as the basis for our consideration of what should be done in DC. I just wanted to point out to you that there are 55 countries working on World Health Organization age-friendly cities. 55 countries across the world are doing what we're doing here in DC. It's very popular to get involved in making changes. In the US, we're more focused on a term you've heard too, livable communities. You've heard livable communities. This has become the center of gravity for our government who have been talking about livable communities and how we're going to create them. The processes are slightly different, but the outcome is intended to be the same. Look at what you're doing now, make changes so that you're ready for the population that is going to be older in the future, and there's gonna be many, many more of us with gray hair. So in DC, we, and, and this I just explained to you, in DC we're working through a process that the World Health Organization has said, this is how you're going to do it. They've been very clear about it. And you see that first block on the left, upper left, 
It says step one, that is the block in which you participated by giving us your opinions of what's good about DC and what should change. The next block is where we are now. The, the task force for age-friendly DC is meeting. They're meeting with groups of people who are people who have information in their minds about what could be done about each domain using the information that you shared as the foundation for what they decide. Then we're going to execute the plan. And when the plan is executed, it's going to be possible for you to be aware of those changes because we'll keep you informed as we go forward. And then the World Health Organization will be here in 2017 to see if we were able to transform the city in accordance with the plan. So that's the process we're going through. Here are the domains that Age Friendly has been working on. <laughs> Outdoor spaces and buildings. By and large, this is where our activities around accessibility are focused. And you would tell me, how many of you would tell me, that there are restaurants where you can't get in because there are too many steps to get in the door, or it's too loud when you get inside. Too loud when you, I heard a murmuring on the too loud when you get inside. Um, we, we know from listening to you that too loud when you get inside is a real issue for our, uh, our outdoor space when it comes to uh, restaurants. And there are lots of other things we learn. Transportation, we love our transportation ex uh, system except for the last mile. It's getting from our house to the metro it's getting from our house to the bus station. That's where we need to pay attention. And that's what you heard John Thompson talking about that Seabury is involved in working on here in DC, that last mile issue, getting you from your home to where you need to go, but getting you also to transportation that you can use because we have a great subway system and bus system. Social participation. This is what villages are about. This is what this whole business of getting you involved in each of your neighborhoods with other people, and this is what the block by block walk is about. How many of you have participated in the block by block walk or know about it? Yes, I see the hands in the air. We have one third of the city already walked. We have one third of the city where teams have gone, single member district teams have gone and walked through and found walkability issues, cracks in the sidewalk, you heard about this earlier, or where there are or are not amenities and services in your neighborhood. So social participation comes out of that activity and you'll hear more about that. Where's Jennifer Dixon Cravens? Right here. Uh, would you please stand up? She's going to be walking around and registering you to, if you're interested in being involved in the block by block walk and you haven't had the opportunity to do so, so far. Respect and social inclusion. I, I, I will tell you that the, what we heard from those who live in the district is that people don't get up for you when you get on the bus. People don't get up for you because you're old. Um, I, I don't, I, that's an issue for us here in D.C. We, you know, it's kind of hard to stand up on the metro these days for those who are older. And that is an example of where we need to change the attitudes that we have about older people by those who are younger. Civic participation and employment, a third of you, a third of you want to work but you want to work in more flexible positions than you can get now. The kind of work you'd like to do, we heard, was work that would stimulate your mind, get you really going, not just putting papers together or something of that sort. You want to really do meaningful work. So we're going to be working on where we're going to have more flexible positions available. 
the, the areas of uh, communication and information, there, there is a real need on the part of people in D.C. to learn technology. We had Verizon here this morning, and you're going to have the opportunity to talk to them. They represent where we're going. But most of you like paper, want to read papers, want to look at things on paper. Um, I, um, I, am, I'm, I am, in fact, looking at a note, and I'm told I should speed up. So I'm just going to read to you the rest of these. Community support and health services is an area where we've got lots to do. Emergency preparedness. Uh, resilience, this is a domain specific to D.C. and a very important one uh, for us to be involved in. Elder abuse, neglect, and fraud is another specific to D.C. domain, and we have learned a lot from you on these issues. So I think what I would say is, Jennifer, are there people who want to get involved in Block by Block Walk? Yes, I'm seeing hands, and uh, as you see Jennifer walk around, pull her over, because she's going to start walking around. Um, this is Beth Baker's book. I, uh, you heard from her earlier. We have a copy to give away, and my question to you is who's, whose birthday is today? Anybody with a birthday today? Anybody with a birthday this week? There's the, there's the person who is getting the book by Beth Baker. Um, would Beth, where are you? And, and will you note who that person is? And, and now, we have a book by Jean Cohen. And do you remember that the National Center for Creative Aging is going to have a conference in June? Whose birthday is June 10th? June 10th. I see a hand over here. Are there any more hands in the air? You're the winner of the book uh, by Jean Cohen. Very good. Very, very good. I'm proud of you. Now, let me note to you that um, we would love to take questions, and there was a, a, a question from you, and I'd love to start there. Go ahead. I can't bring you the mic. I'm going to repeat your question. Um, what's the purpose of her book? Obviously, you sat and you made a plan. Some of us are not going to go with that plan. It's repulsive to me to put me with things. Um, what I'd like to do is to repeat this. This was more of a comment than a question, and, and what she's reacting to is Beth Baker's book on getting involved in your neighborhood and staying put by having people who are uh, not family in their homes. And she doesn't want any help from us getting uh, a job. She's, she's an entrepreneur, and she's made a, uh, a career, and she doesn't want to be among old people. So, and, and that, by the way, is something we hear very often. So she's not an unusual person. Any other comments or questions or stories? I see one. Okay, go ahead. How many U.S. cities have already earned the age-friendly designation? How many U.S. cities have already earned the, uh, the uh, World Health Organization age-friendly city designation? Two. There are 22 working on it, but there are two. Portland, Oregon, and New York City. And that's it. The rest of it. Go right ahead. Midnight, it's not going to work. But as long as you have similar pages, how sharing your work has been very successful. 
sorry, we have a comment again on Beth Baker's uh, presentation of opportunities to stay put in the neighborhood, and the comment reflected on house sharing and the fact that age age similarities help because of common uh, interests and so on, and because those who are younger may have different habits than we do in terms of noise and so on. But I will tell you that there is also a role for putting students together in housing with older persons, and, and that can work as well, and we ought to be thinking about it. Go ahead. Okay, so, th so the question relates to transportation and, and the metro uh, activity, and I want to start by saying that Richard Sarles, the head of the Washington uh, WOMATA, Metropolitan, uh, can you do it for me? Transportation Authority, I, I was failing myself, um, is on the task force with those of uh, Romaine Thomas is on the task force as well. There are, there are people from the non-government side and uh, Richard Sarles is among them. There is a very, very deep interest in, in making changes to WOMATA so that that last mile problem is solved that we've got and to deal with the inclusion and respect issues. We've got to come up with an advertising campaign that gets those who are uh, able to be aware that those who have issues with standing up on the bus have to change their behavior. And it's got to be funny. It's got to be fun. One more question, and this is our last. Yes. Uh, I have been housing students from the university for 20 years. It's good to have college students around you. They help you keep your youth they help you in so many other ways. So you don't necessarily have to have older people around you all the time. Just try the youth. Many of us in our neighborhood, we have youth living with us and we live alone. So I, I would just um, um, I repeat quickly, I think she had a good big voice, but she is telling you that she's had students in her house for 20 years, and she has enjoyed it. Let me note to you that now we've discussed enough of this that you know that choice is absolutely essential. Some of us want young people in our home because we like the fact that we keep young and other people have different opinions on that. Now. As we're closing, I'm going to bring back Alicia and Rick, and you can go out with music. Thank you, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed the presentation today. Since we are actually close to the end of our time, I'm going to go ahead and cede my time to Rick, and he's going to play for us and let us go out with music, as Gail said. So thank you all.